We'd like to thank Mainspring Companies for sponsoring Season 1 of The Next Entrepreneur. Mainspring celebrates the entrepreneurial journey, and we are very grateful for their support. My husband is in sales. I try, you know, that's his job, and I am a hairdresser. So for us, we had no nonprofit um, experience at all. But right after she passed away, probably a couple months later after, we uh, in 2012, we decided that we had to do something. It was part of maybe the grief process or something, but it was like, I've got to do something because we had so much support and love. And I know that that personally I can help so many families. And I wanted that. I wanted to take that pain away as much as possible. I'm Andrew McClendon, your host of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm here today with our producer, Mr. Daniel Sagona with Propel Productions. Daniel, thank you for the great job that you're doing for the Next Entrepreneur. And our guest today is Kim Bowman. Kim, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. So uh, we started this from the beginning to host traditional business entrepreneurs as well as social entrepreneurs. And so I've invited you here today as a social entrepreneur and and uh, looking at your successes in the Bella Bowman Foundation uh, to date it's obvious that you it is very much an entrepreneurial endeavor and congratulations on all your success there thank you it, it truly is and 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 the day that we started I never knew that we would be where we are today you know in 2012 no way but yeah. you know we're excited that um, people really believe in us and that means so much to us. Yeah. It's a great story that I'm looking forward to getting into. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge your recent, uh, award or, uh, included on the list of the influential women in business, um, from the Baton Rouge business report. Yes. Right. So that must've been pretty exciting for a, a nonprofit to be included in a, a list like that. It was. I, I just looked on the stage with all these other amazing women and thought, wow, you know, this is a big honor. And I was so grateful to be thought of for sure. Yeah. Congratulations on that. That, that really Thank is you. impressive, but very fitting uh, when you see what you've done uh, with your foundation. So I wanted to uh, mention a bit about um, something that we do in, in our foundation at McClendon Family Foundation. And um our listeners know that we provide adaptive bikes to children with special needs. Uh, but we, it, when we're making our uh, adaptive bike deliveries, we film uh, the delivery, right? And we'll uh, propel production. We'll, we'll film that. They'll uh, edit it up and put out a nice piece. Sometimes it's a mini documentary type style in which the families share their journeys. Um, and, we do this in an effort to bring awareness to those not familiar with what is, is involved in uh, raising a child with special needs, uh, uh, to bring that to their attention, but also, uh, you know, to, to help with educating them in what's involved there. And I think that we have stayed focused on that because I believe that to be very powerful think that the more the general public has an understanding of um, the way that other people have to live their lives to deal with some challenges is empowering to all of us. And so with that in mind, I want to start by asking you to tell us about the journey of your family um, and what ultimately led to the creation of a foundation in honor of your daughter? Yeah, it's um, it's a great story, and um, it's it's one that I love to tell. So thank you for asking. I, you know, in our daughter Bella was six, seven at the time, because it's all around her birthday time and things. But it really started back in March two thousand and ten. And um, we have another daughter, and she was three at the time. So we had a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. And Bella 
was just kind of getting sick very often. It was very strange. I never forget it was, you know, in March because it was we were going to the St. Patty's Day Parade and it was odd for her to wake up being sick. So, of course, the first thing that goes through your mind is it's the flu. It's one of these things, these stomach aches or things like that. Well, it got to be where she was actually throwing up every day practically. Um, and that lasted a very long time until December when I finally said to all the doctors and the people that were truly trying to figure it out that, listen, we're getting admitted, we're going to the hospital, and I want an MRI. You know, this mother gut instinct was there's something else going on, and I just felt like it was something that would show us in her brain. So we um, did an MRI on New Year's Day, and that's when we found the brain tumor. And it was right there where it would make you nauseated, and it just really made sense to everyone. So we found it, and it was the thing that I asked from God was just give me an answer. And he did. And I said, all right, let's, let's start fighting. And so, you know, January 5th, she had a a major brain surgery and did that quick, that quick. I mean, it was, it went from new year's day to, okay. And in that five days, what we were doing as parents, um, we were trying to figure out the, the perfect doctor for her. Right. And I mean, perfect meaning in our eyes that have no idea anything about the brain or any of this, this stuff. I mean, you, you, you instantly, you know, become someone who knows a lot about, you know, what's going on at that time. So for us, we had, I think, I feel like this was a a tremendous time. I think Bella brought this together. We had two doctors from St. Jude, two neurosurgeons, and we had two neurosurgeons from Baton Rouge at our Lady Lake Children's Hospital. We had them on a call and you realize this is like, vacation time. We had one, you know, two, one doctor was on the slopes in Vail and we FedEx scans over overnight. So it was, it was, it was awesome to know that these four doctors who were all equally could have done an amazing job talked and we decided we're going to stay here in Baton Rouge to do the surgery and then we'll go to St. Jude. So really it could have been done even quicker than that, but we really wanted to make sure we had the right doctor. Okay, right. Gotcha. But so after her brain surgery was very successful, they removed every bit of the tumor that's when our journey started uh, in Memphis at St. Jude. But I think I read that uh, the way that the tumor, where the tumor was, it was it was a very risky uh, yes. procedure, right? I it mean, was. There, there was a lot at stake one way or the other. Yes. Yeah, so they told us that after surgery, she may not be able to swallow, breathe, walk, or talk. Um, and that would lose a lot of her quality of life. So from the get-go, it was really scary to know that we are about to, I mean, because at this point she was on Zofran, so she was feeling great and looked like it's a, I mean, she was a little underweight. She was seven and weighed 28 pounds. Um, But, you know, other than that, she was extremely happy. She was riding the IV poles down the halls of the hospital and, you know, stealing every doctor and, and nurse's heart, even the maid service. I mean, everyone was like, let's go see Bella. So for us, it was, it was extremely hard, but we had to just put our trust in God and realize that this is, it has to be done. Now, how is she processing this as a seven-year-old? I mean, she had been sick for much of the year, which had to be just, you know, really way on, way on her. But then how did she process the diagnosis and, and uh, through the surgery? Well, you know, the night that we told her, you know, we had, there's a wonderful, um, there's wonderful child life specialists that, that, that come in and they say, we can help you. We can help you talk to your child about any diagnosis or what's going on. And we love them and we use them for many things, but we said, you know, we're going to go talk to her, just mom and dad, because we really know our child the best and we know how to tell her something that could be extremely scary. The surgery was in the morning, so she was coloring, and we um, had a picture of her brain that the doctors had explained to us kind of in a, you know, very easy way that this is where it is, and this is what we have to get rid of, and so we, my husband just kind of put that picture on her little coloring tray and just grabbed this little red crayon, and he just drew a little dot and said, you know what, Bella, that, see that little red dot right there? that is what's making you so sick and we got to get it out. And 
she said. No, I'm good. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> she felt all right. Yeah, just keep this IV in. I'm good. It's making me feel better. Um, but that's exactly what we said. And, and we said, listen, you know, you're going to be fine. And in the morning, we're going to just go roll right in there. And those doctors are going to take you. You're going to go to sleep and just, it'll be fine. And, and, you know, the next morning we had every single person in there, um, with Bella, every, I mean, people that we didn't even know, staff all in the room and we were praying and she just loved every second of it. And, um, it was very calming and she was ready to go. And we told her, like, this is probably a couple of the last words that we said, because we, you know, when you have a child, you're able to go and do more than if you're an adult going into surgery. So we were there. We asked if they would put her to sleep in front of us so we could have that peace of mind for her. Um, but right before they did, we asked um, her that her daddy said, listen, I am going to be there when you wake up. And when you do, I want you to tell me how much you love me. I want you to talk to us. I want you to breathe and I want you to talk and I want you to swallow. Like we were just telling her all the things that we thought weren't going to happen. We were like, please, you know, do this for daddy. Right. And she said, okay, thumbs up. And so when it was time to, when she was waking up from surgery, of course I couldn't be in there. I mean, you know, there's just some things that I can do and there's some things that her daddy can do. Right. And I was on the outside of the, the room with a nurse, um, and my mom was in there with my husband, with Trey, and he, she had a cell phone and she had me on speaker and she was telling me everything they were doing, like, you know, so I could be involved. And so, um, they took, um, the tube out and she started to wake up and she looked at her daddy and she said, daddy, is the red dot gone? And it was just like, oh, get I mean, like, I think we were all holding our breaths and we just, we could breathe. You know, and then three days later, she's walking, she's eating. I mean, it's just amazing. So there was uh, something I read about the red birds. Was, was that was that a story that happened before the surgery? No, okay. that happened right before she passed I away. See. Uh, I see. Uh -huh. That's right. And the red dot will also come into play as yeah. well. Okay. Um, she wrote this story. Yeah. You know, from the beginning, she she told us what to do next. Yeah, that's amazing. So we'll get to that in yeah. a bit. So, yeah. so post-surgery, she she was feeling better. Feeling so, great. She yeah. jumped for the first time. You know, our daughter, um, she uh, she also was a little delayed. And so, you know, some things she couldn't do. She couldn't jump and she couldn't do some other things. And so we are, you know, swim lessons. We did all these things. So, I mean, we did go to St. Jude and when we went to St. Jude, the doctor said, you know, we have to do radiation on the spot. We've gotten the tumor. We're not trying to, you know, eliminate any tumor that's there. We just have to radiate. There's such a high percentage of it coming back. When it comes back, it's, it comes in vengeance down her spine. It could do so many really bad things. And so, you know, we made the decision um, to do radiation for Bella. And we did proton radiation instead of photon, which... Proton is, was the newer thing. Um, at the time, St. Jude did not have a proton beam, so they sent us to uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And so that's where our journey continued, and she did 33 treatments uh, of radiation to um, the back of her neck. And, you know, it's not just her going in and getting a little radiation. It was they put her to sleep 33 times. Oh, my goodness. And we were there with her every time they put her to sleep now what was the frequency of those it was um monday through friday um every day okay. she would get a treatment and so some days it would skip and we'd have to wait the whole weekend for the next one because if the beam was down or you know so so it did go a little bit longer um time than we thought so we were there from about february to may in jacksonville getting uh radiation yeah, it was, it was, it was, and we stayed at a Ronald McDonald's. We, we, you know, we, our family came up numerous times. Uh, her teachers came up. I mean, some of my really great friends came up. So, you know, we really had a lot of family and friends coming to help us, um, you know, and all the packages that they gave her. I mean, you know, the girl got a card every day, which was great. Um, but it was, it was hard. And I had a three-year-old as well who would come visit 
So y'all stayed in Jacksonville for straight through. Yes. For months we never, time. we never came home because we were there Monday through Friday in Jacksonville was not easy drive home. And, right. um, and she's getting radiation, you know, right. she's tired. Right. Um, you know, so, so my, you know, my other daughter would come up and someone would drop her off with me and then they'd go back and I'd have both by, sometimes by myself, you know, right before, um, Bella was diagnosed, my husband had gotten laid off. And so, and I'm a hairdresser, so we both didn't work, you know, for nine months and it took him nine months to find another job. Um, and so he was there, thank goodness, but then he'd, you know, fly off to go do his third and fourth interviews to trying to get his, you know, provide for his family. So it was a lot of different things going. And, um, but we had that family support. My mom came a lot. My dad came, you know, my in-laws came, my sister, I mean, everyone came to help as much as they possibly could because everybody had life at home right. as well. Sure. Um, so after that, we came home and we had a wonderful summer swim lessons and, you know, getting caught up with school and all these things. And then in August, Bella, we were in Atlanta visiting family and she started to like, she didn't want to walk down the stairs and she started to slur a little bit. And I immediately felt that the tumor was back. And so of course we called her doctor and he's like, you need to come tomorrow. And we did, we drove up to St. Jude and did her scans and they, he sat us down and he said, uh, she has, um, brainstem necrosis. And I'm like, okay, what's that? And what do we do? You know, like, it was just like the next thing. Like, right. okay, she's done amazing through everything, yeah. right? And he's like, well, that's a little bit trickier. Um, we don't really have a known cure for that. And what it is is that the radiation just worked a little too good, and it's eating away in her brainstem. Gotcha. So we can't do surgery. We can't take it out. So he said there's these hyperbaric oxygen treatments that, that – we found might work, but we don't have any scientific knowledge to say, yes, this is what you have to do. So we said, all right, sign us up. So we stayed in Memphis and she did over 60 treatments. And that was every day for two hours a day, she would go in this tank and they would like deep dive kind of. Right. And it would just give this great oxygen to her brain. Now that must have been a little uh, scary for a, uh, it was, yes. Eight-year-old, I guess, at this point. Yes, she um, actually, she, um, I feel like she definitely turned eight during hyperbaric oxygen treatments because <laughs> when she went in, I laugh because it was such a great, great day. When she went in, we secretly, you know, decorated everything like Rapunzel. Her grandmother made her a Rapunzel cake and all these things and presents, and we decorated their um their little break room for a big party for Bella. So when she came out, we surprised her, uh, turning eight, um, which was her golden birthday because it's September 8th. And so anyways, it was just a really fun day. So, um, yes, it was. So that's eight, eight. She was eight on September 8th. She was eight on September 8th, yes. So, um, and she, you know, birthdays for her was big. So it was great. But, yes, it was scary. And we were in a children's hospital in the middle of Memphis downtown and it was scary. And she was in there with adults. She was in there with like two other people who may have had like their nose off or, I mean, yeah. you know, it was scary, but she had a great, the staff was amazing. And they would, they had, she had a nurse in there and she had a little potty in there when she had to go potty. I mean, it was just something I've never, ever thought I'd, ever imagined that we would go through in our lives, you know. So you had to do that for a couple of months, right? Yeah, it was 60 treatments. And she did every one without a, without a complaint. And in the beginning, it started to look like it worked. And then towards the end, you know, it was harder for her to even walk, walk there from the parking lot. And you could just tell that her little body was just not taking it anymore and it wasn't helping so we decided the other option, which was the last option, was to do a chemo called Avastin, um, which was so scary to me because we've never done chemo. And I, I assumed chemo was worse than radiation, you know, but, you know, I've seen so many different things. It, treatment alone is just bad. But so we, um, I say we, but she uh, got her first treatment of Avastin at St. Jude 
And they told us that, you know, you can do this at the affiliate in Baton Rouge, you know? And I said, well, we're very comfortable here. Can we stay here? (laughs) You know, we love y'all and we just feel good in Memphis and we know everyone. And they were like, sure, absolutely. But, you know, I promise you, you're going to be okay. And so after the second treatment, we um, said, let's, let's go home because I really felt like it wasn't working. And we were um, in the Ronald McDonald house. It was me, my mom, and my other daughter, um, who was four at the time, and Bella. Now, this is now in December that we've still been, you know, in Memphis. And I just had this gut feeling again saying, she's, she's not getting any better. And she wants to be home for Christmas. And I'm ready to go home. And so I literally packed us up that early morning and I told her doctor, I'm, I'm going back. And so we left and, um, on the way home, she started choking, like just by drinking some water or whichever. And I was like, that's, that's not right. And so I called the, um, St. Jude affiliate I said, Hey, we're coming in hot. So he, who's here, you know, I haven't seen you since January, but we're coming in and I don't want to go home. My husband was out of the country. Um, he had just stopped, started his job. Um, and so his company was in Sweden. So he was in Sweden and I was scared. And so I didn't want to stay home by myself with Bella. And so they said, come, come on. And they brought us straight into the ER and got to know us again. And a lot of them did remember us because she has a very lasting impression on many people. And um, we met, that's when we met Dr. Jones. And she said, I want y'all to stay tonight so I can get to know y'all a little bit better. And I'm like, thank you. So um, we did. We stayed in the hospital. And it was um, just a lot of tests to see what was going on. And about, I think it was the second night, she was eating some soup and the nurse came in and said, Kim, um, we need to talk to you outside. And I said, okay. And so we walked outside, and, and Dr. Deo was also her um, oncologist. And we went and sat and talked. And he goes, Kim, I really thought I was going to have this conversation with you in about six months. But we need to put Bella on a ventilator, and we need to do it now. And I don't know that she's going to come off. And I just sat there and looked at him like, what? Like, I was just dumbfounded. Um, and I just said, can we call my husband so she can talk to him before we do this? He has to hear her voice right. one more time. Right. And so I immediately called on my family to come back up, and and we called Trey, and I think it probably was 3 or 4 in the morning in Sweden. And um, she talked to him and said, you know, you know, everything he said, everything he could and that he wanted to. Um, if it was his last conversation with her and, um, which I can't even imagine what that was going through him for him. And then, um, right before about to go and the ER doctor is really looking at me like we, we have to go. And I said, can we please do one more thing? Can I let her go get on the potty and go by herself? Cause that was a big deal because that had take, you know, it, you know, the brain does some crazy things. That was one thing it wasn't letting her do, but when she did it, she was so proud. And so the nurse said, yes, Kim. We can do that. And she helped me get her on there and she did it. And she was so proud. And I just said, okay, let's go. And I just looked at her and I said, Bella, I need you to breathe. That's all mommy needs. And I'll be right back. And so, cause I had to step out of the room while they did that and they sedated her. Um, and I was so scared because I was alone without my, my best friend. He was, you know, on his way back um, so I got, I went in there right after and she's like, thumbs up. <laughs> I'm like, really? I'm like, gosh, you are the best thing in this earth. Like she is just, just amazing. So, um, I pretty much just watched her for 24 hours straight. And as soon as, um, my husband got in the door, uh, she was sleeping and I was standing there and he came in and I just, we sat down and I just, I'm sure there was a lot of tears, but it was, we just looked at each other and said, I don't want her to suffer. And, you know, if this is what God wants, this is what we're going to do. We're going to just, this is not, I mean, we're not going to resuscitate pretty much, you know. Um, We both like literally, we're going to sing the same things to each other. 
And so, you know, we just gave her the last amazing 10 days of her life. You know, every day it was, what does Bella want today? What can we do for Bella? And what can we do for Baylor, her sister? You know, what can we do for our family to remember this girl more than anything and just have these wonderful memories and, 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 and just not think about what's going to happen. You know, um, the staff just was amazing. The friends that came in, we, you know, she, um, she got a, a black kitten that she's always wanted. She got to meet Miss Louisiana flew in the um, night before overnight flew in when she heard about Bella. Um, she, um, make a wish, um, said, what do you want? And she wanted to see this chipmunk movie that had just come out and with her cousin, who was also her best friend. And so we made some things happen with some, uh, some good friends in town and make a wish did too. And we had the production company fly someone with the movie and yeah. And we all in the, um, family playroom we had to it had to be very hush hush and only our immediate family could be in there and we watched the entire movie and she stayed awake almost the entire time giggling with her um with her cousin and it was the most amazing thing and then they took that movie back and she had to fly back that night it was crazy i'm like it, it was amazing and we you know she got her first communion we had a nun, because we're not Catholic, but Bella really just had this amazing um, spirit and just loved the Catholic religion. And That's so we had a nun that we had she had met through her stay there, who now is like one of our very best friends. And we had our pastor there, and they both gave her her first communion. And it was just the most amazing experience. So we just, we decorated her room for Christmas. Um, Santa brought her her um, Barbie doll that she wanted, her holiday Barbie that she wanted. It was, it was unbelievable. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, so like right before she died, probably the night, the day before, you know, we just could kind of tell that she was, um, she was coherent. I mean, throughout the entire time, but we could just tell like, some things were happening. She was getting fever and just some things that go through the process of, of dying, I guess. And we, uh, we had a talk with her cause it was like, it's time to let, let her know that you can stop fighting because for Bella, it was, are you proud of me? Oh. You know, I'm doing my best mommy and daddy. Cause we'd always say, you know, get through this, Bella, can you get through this? And, 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 you know, we're just, is, we're so proud of you. So we just knew that we had to tell her that she could go if she wanted to. And um, that was the that was probably one of the hardest conversations to have with a eight year old. Um, but she said we sat and told her that you know it's it's okay if you want to be with Mary and Jesus. And you know we're we're a very religious family and we really believe and um, and knew that she was going to a really great place and so she said she nodded yes she was ready and we told her that it was okay that we were extremely proud of her I mean we were literally just try to tell her everything we could and she I said well listen because a friend of mine had said to ask her what she would come back to see you as and I said okay that's kind of weird but okay I will I'm going to do it I'll do anything at this point and so I did I said what would you like you know I want mommy and daddy want you to come visit us as much as possible what what would you, what, what do we need to look for? And she said, um, a bird. And she, I said, and that's what I had to say, you know, I had to, cause she couldn't really talk. So I had to, we had like a little message board and I was like a blue bird or red bird. And she's a red bird. I'm coming back as a red bird. And I said, okay, you know, and we'll look for them. And, you know, we see them all the time oh, there, you know, they're there when we need them the most. So, yeah. So having that conversation with her was, was I'm just so grateful that we had the time that we did with her to be able to Those do that. Those last 10 days sound so special. They were. I mean, uh, it's just very touching. Uh, Kim, let's take a quick break there. Thank you for sharing that story. It's, it's very heart-wrenching, and um, I, I appreciate you sharing that in the way that you did. We'll take a break and get in a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. We would like to thank MBD Automation for their support 
of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. MBD Automation is a mechanical install contractor with a program-centric focus. So what do these guys do? They install conveyor systems, VRCs, platforms, singulators, sorters, and all sorts of other types of automated equipment. Who do they work for? They work for systems integrators, manufacturers, and end users in fulfillment centers, airports, mail processing facilities, and projects in the defense industry. MBD Automation works for numerous Fortune 500 companies across the United States and has a list of international clients that they perform work for in the U.S. as well. If MBD Automation can help you on your next project, you can find them online at mbdautomation.com. And we are back with Kim Bowman with uh, Bella Bowman Foundation. So, Kim, your husband, Trey, Mm -hmm. is uh, in this foundation working with you on the regular, right? Oh, yeah. It's it's the both of y'all. It is. It is. And I will say this, too. You know, I was thinking about, when I was thinking about this podcast this weekend, about what what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And there is one thing that I have to say that, you know, we would not be where we are today if it wasn't for the core group of volunteers that we have. It's I have a group of ladies, and I, I guess I could say they're has husbands as well, but who have been with me, and Trey and I actually, um, since day one, and they are still with us, and they do anything and everything we need. So it's hard to say that it's me or it's right. Trey and I, it's, it is the foundation, truly. Yeah, yeah that's strong. Yeah. So I did want to ask you, um, for you and Trey, mm-hmm. uh, as you look back on uh, your daughter's life, what you learned from Bella? Well, that is a great question. And I will tell you, it's four words that we kind of have as our motto because it truly is what she taught us. And, and we didn't really realize all of them until after she had passed, but it was, it's courage, it's belief and it's faith and it's strength. Those four things. I mean, she had, and she taught us that, you know, if a seven, eight year old girl can go through all these things, so can you. And and this is how you get through those hard times. And, you know, I really believe as well that, you know, um, there is a plan for us and we don't always know what that plan is or understand it. But if we just follow the signs, you're going to get to where you go and you will definitely see what your purpose is. Um, and we just truly believe that. And we just, you know, she truly guides us in every single way. Just when we're think just when we think that we're a little defeated or, Oh, that's just not going to work. Or, or, or what are we going to do next? Like something just pops up. And I really mean that for brings us onto the next part of our journey. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So they started the foundation. Walk us through um, how you got there and what it looked like initially. So, you know, um, my husband is in sales you know, that's his job. And I am a hairdresser. So for us, we had no nonprofit um, experience at all. But right after she passed away, probably a couple months after we uh, in 2012, we decided that we had to do something. It was part of maybe the grief process or something. But it was like, I've got to do something because we had so much support and love. And I know that that personally, I can help so many families. And I wanted that. I wanted to take that pain away as much as possible. Um, so we decided to start the Bella Bowman Foundation with this core group of volunteers who were her teachers, her dance teacher, you know, my best friend, you know, just certain people that really um, was was kind of going with that journey with us and said that they were on board. And we trusted that, you know. So you had a front row seat of the process yes. of having a child with a terminal illness and what, you know, maybe could be there, what services maybe were needed to help, you know, families in that situation. Yes. Right. So, so you knew what, you knew where uh, the need was. I knew what was needed from a non-medical side. Right. For sure. Right. Right. And I felt like, 
this is something that I had to do. And I just, we just put every, every waking hour into this in the beginning. And we said, this is the three things that we really want to concentrate. And that's where we got our rec from our, you know, research, education, and comfort care. We knew that we wanted to find research to help with brain tumors to help uh, a better treatment. We did not want to find a cure for cancer because we knew that there were some amazing places doing that. And that's just something that we just didn't want to concentrate on, but we did want to find a safer treatment. So, um, you know, we do have a research study with Mary Bird Perkins and LSU, Dr. Newhauser, he's head of physics with LSU. um, And we are just doing some amazing strides with that on radiation and brain tumors. So you know, then we knew we wanted to educate. We wanted to give that non-medical uh, point of view. You know, when you're a parent and a doctor or a nurse or anyone in the medical staff comes in, we want to be able to make them understand what we're going through. So that might make them a better um, person in, in, what, in our delivery of messages. Um, so we, we like to go and um, speak out and talk about our experiences and do a bunch of question and answers at different um, different places and in different uh, medical staff that invite us. We love that because it's really truly important. We we love to do anything in conferences as well, like where we are a parent panel where we can help answer any questions that may need um, on a parent non medical way. Um, but our biggest passion, I guess, is the comfort care component. It is something that we. Um, we do on a daily basis and it started off with a comfort care bag and it's a bag that has a blanket, a roll of quarters, some deodorant, toothbrush, toothpaste, um, you know, maybe a small toy, a hairbrush, just things that we either had or didn't have, um, or that we felt we, that we needed. Um, and we put it in a bag and we said, you know, we went to our lady Lake children's hospital and went to child life and said, listen, we want to donate these bags. And we want you to give these to the families with cancer. And they said, absolutely, thank you. Well, it got to be so great where they said, listen, we have this um, terminal um, child that came in. It was a car accident. And we really want to give the family a comfort care bag. They've been here for a week. Is it okay if we give them one of your comfort care bags? I'm like, absolutely. So it just moved into a much bigger thing where now it's for any family that's there for uh, a longer term or a very medically fragile child. Um, and so it's, it's amazing because a child life specialist can walk in the door that they they don't know what's behind that door, meeting a family for the first time with this bag of all these great, wonderful things to make you have comforts of home and say, you know, this is what I have for you. And then how else can I help you? So it's been an amazing journey with that. That's probably the biggest part of the comfort care component. Um, and, you know, we just are very proud of that bag, and we have a lot of lo- local businesses that help donate to that. Yeah, you know. Very cool. It is. So uh, you've been really successful in your events mm-hmm. uh, that your foundation has created, mm-hmm. and um, and it, it strikes me that your marketing degree uh, really came into play because uh, you've had great success with those. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, you know, 2012, we started, and we said, okay, well, let's have a gala And so, um, we decided to have Bella's ball and it started with, I mean, that year we had probably 300 attendees. We raised about $60,000 and we were just ecstatic. We couldn't believe it. We put it together in like literally three months and we were just like so grateful. Well, now that we just had our ninth annual, which it was virtual because it, um, it was, it's always in March and it, it got, you know because of everything happened, we didn't, we weren't able to have it in March, but, um, you know, we are now raising over $300,000. We have the last year to that, you know, in the ninth and well, I'm sorry, the eighth annual ball was last year. We had over a thousand attendees and we did raise $320,000, I think. So, I mean, it is just the most amazing event and it's not just, um, it's not, I mean, granted, we love, it is a fundraiser, but what we love for people who walk away is they walk away saying, wow, first of all, that was so much fun. Second of all, I really truly know what they do right? right. and where my dollar just went. Yep. And to me, that's like the most important. That's powerful. 
It is powerful. And so we also have another event, the Bella's Royal Celebration. Now that came into play around Bella's birthday in September. And we wanted, uh, children really wanted to come to Bella's Ball. But of course, it's an adult event. And so we made an event that children could feel special as well. And then we also, it's a teaching tool to say how you can be a superhero for someone else. Even if you're three years old, you can do something. And so it's a, it's a very interactive, um, it's like a luncheon that we do with children to teach them how to give back and not a not, in a not scary way at all. But I don't know if you know this also with our comfort care component that we do, we have over 30 characters that visit the hospital and we go room to room, um, with all these different princesses and superheroes. So that, event Bella's Royal Celebration has every one of them come to the event where they can all sit and take pictures and talk to them oh, that's and fantastic. see kind of what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. That's fantastic. And so it's teaching uh, the Royal Celebration is, is teaching children about giving and caring, right? Oh yeah. It's like coloring a card to put in our comfort care bags I see. and it has their name on it and they colored it and they write messages. Um, you know, we, we show them how we make these comfort care bags and how you can help put them together. Um, and we just, we really show them that, you know, just with a whoopee cushion, how you can make someone smile. And we do, we give them each a whoopee cushion and we give them a little cape and we give them a little pin and a little card. And we say, listen, go make somebody happy. You know, go pay it forward. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's great. That's fantastic. It's wonderful. I will tell you, it we've we've had we we've only had three of those events because it came much later because I, I just could not take on another major event in one year, but it was time and we are so excited about it. We love it. It's one of our favorite events. And um, you know, it just really the parents are like, I cannot tell you how much my child has talked about this event and how yeah. much it meant to them and, and how, how it wasn't scary talking about Bella being in heaven, you know, yeah. um, because those are conversations you will have to have with your children. It may not be uh, their sister or brother, but it might be grandma, or grandpa, you know? Sure. And so it just makes, it makes things a little bit easier on mom and dad, you know, the whole family. Kim, that is wonderful. I mean, I, I love that. Uh, Royal Celebration yeah, uh, Program. That's fantastic. So let's talk about uh, some of your long-term goals. Yes. And um, I've read about Bella's house yes. as a long-term goal, right? It's, tell us about your vision for It that. is a long-term goal. And, you know, we're so grateful that Arley Lake has um, Children's Hospital. We have Bella's room there. And that is, it is a palliative care hosp- slash hospice room. It's for the very medically fragile children to go who are chronically ill, who are always in the hospital to have a bet, a little special room to, um, to maybe they will be there their last days, kind of like we were in the hospital. Um, so once we did that, we just, we just knew that we really wanted to have a special place for these children and have the experience we had, but maybe not be in the hospital, you know, but don't, you know, not be in the hospital, but not be at the house, you know, not be home. So it's kind of like going to be, it's kind of would be like a, it's a freestanding facility. So we want it to be a place where you can go and spend those last days with your child and really have those moments like we did and ex- and just and just have that with your child and not worry about um oh my gosh are they going to choke or the, you know you have a medical staff member there to be there to make you feel comfortable but also have you know things where we can make their lives very 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 comfortable and give them the comforts at home. And then also have something for bereavement. You know, where do you go after? Where do you go after? There is nowhere. I mean, we struggled with that so much and we want to give that care and to say, you're not alone and we're not going to leave you alone. Like we're going to be here for you whenever you need us. Um, so it's, it's a big dream and it is definitely a long, a long-term goal of ours. And it's something that we, um, are working on currently, um, we're just definitely, we're re- doing all our research right now to see how, how we want this to go. And you've actually traveled around. To we look have. At some We've traveled all facilities. around. Of course, St. Jude in Memphis, they have an amazing palliative care group there with Dr. Justin Baker. And he is like, whatever you need, we are here for you to train, whatever you need to look at and shared everything. We've been to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. We've been in to Houston in Texas. We've been to uh, Minnesota. They have um, 
a children's hospice facility, and we've visited them. Um, we've also been in Boston, Boston's Children's, and, and talked to their whole group too. So we're just really going around to see bits and pieces on how that we can make this work. Um, you know, um, it's a little bit trickier when you're working with children for end of life. It's hard for um, a physician to to say we've done all we can do. Right. You know, and. There is not a facility like that in town um, where it's just for children. Children and adults are different right. in hospice and palliative care. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's a fantastic vision. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, so I know all the work you're putting into that will make it uh, a reality. So best of luck on that. Thank you. Uh, why don't we pause here, get in another break. We would like to thank Modus for their support of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. Who is Modus? Modus is a facility services company that works in the e-commerce fulfillment industry across the United States. What do they do? They like to say they take it from the conveyor to the dock door. Well, what does that mean? It means that they're building the pick stations with the cable management. They're installing guardrails and bollards. They're putting down floor marking. They're putting up aerial signage. These guys build fencing systems, shelving systems, and racking systems. They also do rack recovery for when there's rack failures. They also install dock levelers and dock doors. Modus also installs ASRS systems, which is automated storage and retrieval systems, as well as other robotics projects. They have worked for the largest e-commerce retailers in the world, and they can work for you. If you need to find Modus, you can reach them online at modusmoves.com. And we're back with Kim Bowman with the Bella Bowman Foundation. So, uh, Kim, you've actually been expanding on the Comfort Care program Mm -hmm. here recently. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we, um, you know, we love our family at Our Lady Lake Children's Hospital, but we realize that there are, you know, a lot of other great hospitals that we could give, provide our services to. And so um, we have been in the past year with uh, Children's New Orleans and been, we've been doing um, our comfort care bags. And we also, for all these hospitals, we donate an iPad a month to a child with cancer. Oh, so wow. we started doing that with Children's New Orleans as well as Our Lady Lake Children's Hospital. And we are going to start giving comfort care to Women's Hospital uh, in November, and we are we're super excited to help the neonatal um, ICU there. That's fantastic. And goals beyond those. Um. Yeah. So you know we had we have we've had a lot of goals, and um, one goal um, that we've already completed was Bella and the Redbird book. So never in a million years would I've ever thought that my husband and I and a, and a core group of friends would have written a book, a children's book, but we did. And it's a great book that just helps um, kind of just lead your journey through the the life of, of having a child diagnosed with cancer. And it's a children's book. It's very kid friendly. And it actually just really shows you how to have that courage uh, belief, faith, and strength. It's, it's, it's wonderful. We, we donate those a lot, um, uh, to children with cancer. And then we also, um, sell them so that we can sure. donate them. Yes. Well, that must've been, uh, that must've been a fascinating project, you know, writing that book and producing it and Oh, it was. We had a ghost writer, and thank goodness we did because we had no idea what we were doing, but it was great. I mean, it was a good year of, um, uh, to write this book, and we're so proud. We had local illustrators who were actually really? Bella's art teachers. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, so it's just it's just fun, and a lot of the characters are people that are in our lives that we kind of made look like them. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, one of them is a nurse, and she's one of my good friends. So, oh, that's you funny. know, but she's not really a nurse. But so for us, it's great. We we tried to, to incorporate certain people in there. That's fantastic. Um, tell us about One Louisiana Now. So One Louisiana Now is a project under our foundation that we um, started in March when the pandemic happened. We we um, we really wanted to do something that we could 
do to give back, but we, you know, we couldn't go in the hospitals and we really couldn't even go leave our house. Right. I mean, we couldn't either get ga- even gather right. to, as a group. So we, um, my husband, uh, teamed up with LSU and they were on that part of making these PPP, la- uh, gowns and, um, and was very successful with that. He was, you know, with Dr. Newhauser and just, we were so grateful that they included us in that project, but, on the comfort care side of it, we were like, what can we also donate to these staff, these frontline people who are giving everything of their lives to help others? And so we made these relief bags full of, um, you know, snacks and actually food gift cards and T-shirts. And then we got the community to make coloring cards to say, you know, high five, you've got this and send a message. And so we, we, we made over to 2,500 of these bags and we delivered those across the entire state of Louisiana. To the frontline hospital workers. Right? Yes. To the frontline hospital workers, the firemen, the ambulance worker. I mean, anyone, even the, you know, people that were cleaning the rooms, like everyone that was in from the front line that were dealing with, um, saving our, our, are these all these people's lives yeah. you know they're putting their lives on the, the line to save others lives and so we're like how can we show them that we are behind them and and we we want to give them this little gesture of like you can do this and you've got this that's fantastic yeah it was fun so that was a program that that lived for a few months it lived the yes height of the pandemic it did from about march to june we, uh, we finished in June and we decided, okay, now it's time we got to get back and, and we can, you know, we're not back in the hospitals yet, unfortunately, but, you know, we are still um, delivering comfort care bags and we're about to do Halloween, which is a huge thing that we do at our Lay Lake Jones Hospital. And we just bring everything in a big quarantine box and they quarantine it for a couple of days and they bring it in the hospital and we Zoom call and... And we do everything virtually right now, and we'll do the same for Christmas. Um, we we do so, we do something every holiday for every single child that is in that hospital at that time. That's fantastic. Yeah. I was going to ask how twenty twenty impacted your uh, foundation. You know. We were supposed to have our ninth annual Bella's Ball uh, in March, and a week before the shutdown, uh, we you know we we made the call to. Um, to, to postpone it. And we postponed that to September. So that was one thing that we had to do virtually, which we had never done before, but it was extremely successful. The support was amazing. Um, we just had a silent auction online and, you know, it's, it's been tough. I mean, I have families that are reaching out to me that are getting newly diagnosed and they're, you know, going in to get chemo for the first time with only one parent or having a major brain surgery with just one parent. And so, so I've been able to talk to them over the phone a lot and, um, you know, send gifts, uh, through quarantine. Um, but yeah, we just, we, we load up everything. We, we, we bring it out to the dock. And we, it sits for a couple of days and then they know what to do with it. I, I, I miss everyone so much. And I know that they miss me too, because they send me wonderful messages. Um, but I understand, you know, I don't want to ever do anything that would um, hurt, you know, bring anything into a hospital, sure, but, sure. Um, or vice versa to my family. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a different, it's a different comfort care, but yeah. we are definitely able to do it. And it really, the 2020 has shown us that we can do anything. Yeah. It may be a little different. It might look a little different, but we can still provide all those wonderful things that we are committed to provide. So I read that, uh, your foundation, uh, has helped you define the meaning of your life. Mm-hmm. That's why if you could tell me more about that. Yeah. I mean, it, Oh gosh, you know, if I could just, I wish I could be like the, the welcoming person when they walk in the door, you know, when they first get diagnosed with cancer or, you know, come in because they had a traumatic accident, something. I wish I could just go in and just be there for them. Just hold their hand. Just as, just as I know that I think if Bella was here, what she would be doing, I I know that this is what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes my husband's like, okay, do we have to have another meeting right now? Because I know we're going to come up with a whole new thing. (laughs) And we do this on borrowed time. You know, we are a hundred percent volunteer. 
and my husband has a full-time job. I have a part-time job and everything else is done on our own time. And we love it. We love putting smiles on children's faces and, and giving parents that, getting that look from them like, thank you, just thank you. From It's just giving that comfort. So, you know, I um, I love what I do. I wish I could do more. Yeah. Um, you well, know. it's palpable. I mean, you, you can feel your love for for your project, and, and uh, which is why you're successful at it, right? Oh, yes, and I'll tell you the thing that I've learned is these kids, do so much more for me than I probably do for them. And through grief, it's been tremendous. But for me to really understand how amazing our children truly are, um, you know, they're just, they have done so much for me. Selfishly, I can say that, that, you know, I'll go into a room to put a smile on a child's face and I'll walk out and I have the bigger smile, you know, that's just great. And then my, uh, my daughter Baylor, she's, she loves it as well. And so, and my nephew, Aiden, like, I just hope that they will continue to help me um, just get all those great smiles on these kids, you know, and give them yeah. this com- that comfort that they deserve. Well, look, as we wrap up here, why don't you uh, tell our listeners the best way that they can help your foundation and help you do the work that you're doing, which is incredible, uh, and the ways that they can do that. Well, you can go to our website at um, bellabowman.org, and we do have a Facebook page and Instagram that you can follow us on. But, you know, every donation makes a difference. Every dollar makes a difference. And I had a, a quick story. I had an email the other day, and a lady sent $5, and she had to put a note to say, I know this isn't very much, but it's all I had, and I just knew that I, I had to give it. And I was like, you know what? we are so grateful for, for a dollar. So, you know, you can donate for comfort care bags. You can donate a bell on the red bird book to a child. There's so many things that you can do, um, that we really, really would appreciate. Um, but if you go to the website, you can find everything there. We have some amazing videos as well that show kind of what we do, um, hands on, but we just, just know that every dollar is getting put in the right way. Well, Kim, thank you so much for sharing your story and coming on our podcast, and it is a great treat to meet someone who's passionate about uh, the charitable work that they do as you are, and uh, I'm very grateful. Oh, well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Good. Thank you so much. We are very grateful for Kim sharing the story of her family's journey and the creation of the Bella Bowman Foundation. Kim is a social entrepreneur extraordinaire and has done amazing things with her foundation. Her passion rings true in the services that they provide, the research they have funded, the education programs they have created, and the comfort care packages that they have delivered. We wish Kim and Trey continued success in all the lives that they touch through the Bella Bowman Foundation. Kim can be found online at bellabowman.org. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. We'd like to thank our title sponsor, Mainspring Companies. can be reached online at mainspringcompanies.com. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at ask at nxtentrepreneur.com. You can subscribe to the Next Entrepreneur Podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. You can help support our podcasts by leaving a review on Apple Music. You can follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please share this episode with your family and friends. The Next Entrepreneur is produced by Propel Productions. They can be reached at propelyourstory.com. Today's episode was produced by Daniel Sagona.